Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Rebel Clash, go ahead and check out the Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code Omnipoke. For today's video, we are going to be going over the first of our Darkness Ablaze decks, and of course we are going to be starting with Eternatus, easily the most promising attacker from this set. So let's jump into the basic concept, go through a deck list, talk about a few tech cards, finish up on a few matchups, and uh, I'll give my closing thoughts as well. So the basic concept is pretty simple. The stats on Eternatus VMAX are crazy. It has a really decent hit points, a very efficient attack, and it can hit very nice numbers. Two energy with the um, upside of hitting 270, and then we have additional damage counter placement potentially with Galarian, Zigzagoon, and Scoop Up Net is going to really... Push the meta in a direction where we're likely moving away from a number of the uh, tag team Pokemon. I personally believe that it's only really going to be things like Lucario, Melmetal, and ADP that are going to stay in the format for tag teams. Because this beat stick is just really going to bully everything else in its path, in my opinion. So that's going to be a real shift in the meta based around how solid this deck is at reaching those numbers quite easily. Also, you have that Crobat V from this set. It's an excellent uh, support card because it helps you um, find your stage one, find your energies throughout each turn, and ultimately fill up your board because you want to have a number of Pokemon and access to them in those early turns so that we're doing the damage that we really are looking for for the most part. So that's definitely going to be something we need to bear in mind. And I've already just mentioned the Galarian Zigzagoon, but yeah, that's going to have a big impact here as well. For helping us push damage onto the active for knockouts potentially but also in certain situations it can help like set up certain damage for later so this is very nice flexible um, damage placement that we can gain and we also have Hooper as a one energy attacking one prize option which can be very good against some certain walls that are out in this set and in previous sets that Eternatus can't really do much to. So let's move on to the Pokemon and this list is about as cookie cutter and basic of a list uh, as I could possibly show, in my opinion. We're playing four copies of all the important stuff and three copies of the backup attacker in Hooper. So let's introduce you to the Eternatus V and V Max if you haven't already. Uh, the original V has 220 base hit points as a dark type and has the power XL attack. For a colorless, you can attach um, an energy from your hand to one of your bench Pokemon whilst also doing a 30 damage prod. This is actually really relevant for you and uh, actually helps out quite a bit against uh, energy disruption. Um, so we can try and get that in early and make sure that we have a second Eternatus with an energy on the back as well. So if you happen to be the player going second with this deck, it's actually quite nice if you have the option to have a spare energy in hand um, to get this rolling. And it's a colorless attack as well, so we can get away with having one copy of capped energy in this list. Uh, with no downside, which is also very cool because, again, this deck wants to have a bunch of uh, Pokemon in play. So that's a really nice deal there. The Dynamax uh, cannon, I think, we're never building towards because we don't have enough acceleration. So we'll move straight over to the VMAX. We are also maxing out four copies. Like I said, I want this list to be as basic as possible. And as we've seen with previous VMAX decks, for example, Dragapult, it actually ended up working best even though it had, uh, you know comms and uh, treasures available just playing the full four copies because if you miss your vmax you are extremely sad and i've taken the same approach here eternatus just find your guy as soon as you evolve into your vmax you activate that infinity zone ability which allows you to open up to eight bench pokemon as long as they are all dark types uh, so that's why you're only seeing dark Pokemon in this list. Otherwise, it would be great to have, you know, the Dedenes, the Orangaroos, the Jirachis, all of those tech Pokemon that we know and love. Uh, but Eternatus limits you to only playing dark Pokemon to extend that bench to have a very wide board so that we can use that Dread End attack that does 30 times the number of your dark Pokemon in play. That includes itself. So again, with that 8 bench, including itself, it then does... Um, 270 to the opponent's active, which is a huge amount of damage for just two attachments. Again, one of those is a colorless attachment that opens up that capped energy as well to be a tech card in here. Uh, it could also lead us towards some um, other tech special energy cards that I'll talk about later. 
We have those four Crobat V. The reason why this is so excellent in the deck is that it has the Knight Asset ability. Once during your turn, you can put this straight onto the bench and draw until you have six in your hand. You can't use more than one Knight Asset ability during your turn, so you have to use them sparingly. Um, but they just give you access to more cards, and we are still a combo-based deck. We're still looking to find uh, Energy Turn 1, Energy Turn 2, plus our Evolution, and then as many Pokemon for the bench as we can find, because every time you find a bench Pokemon, it's an extra 30 towards your damage output. So these Crobats are vital, great in the early turns to just get us rolling, and great in that mid-game as well when we're trying to push for things like Boss's Orders. Uh, so definitely something to bear in mind. Just quickly going back to that Infinity Zone now that I have mentioned Crobat, it is one of those sort of fragile two-prize Pokemon that people can sort of pick off at certain points. So it's a nice thing to bear in mind that if an Eternatus VMAX is knocked out, you shut off that Infinity Zone and you go back to a five Pokemon bench size. Sometimes, um, if you're not necessarily needing that maximum damage output in the sort of mid-game, if you've already taken some big like prize swings or whatever, or if you're just looking to boss certain targets for your win condition later on in the game, you can actually allow an Eternatus to get knocked out, the VMAX, uh, and then you can clear off your own board of Crobats so your opponent can't have those easy boss um, boss's orders uh, like win condition knockouts and you can just leave yourself with a bunch of Zigzagoon and Hooper. That's why we have very, very high counts of the one prizes. Even though they may not be useful in a lot of matchups, they do serve their purposes in some uh, enough for them to be in here, but also it means that we have such a high density of one prize Pokemon that we can shut off our own Infinity Zone and clear those bats off the board when need be and give your opponent less easy prize cards because I found that to be sometimes like one of the only lost conditions of Eternatus is that people ignore the Eternatus and just go like, okay, let's gust those Crobats and try and keep up the trade in that regard. So definitely something nice to bear in mind, a small interaction there. We're very rarely attacking with Crobat V, but it does have the attack for a Dark and a Colorless 70 and Poison. And then we move on to those one prize Pokemon. The Galarian Zigzagoon is basically a 40 damage drop whenever you bench him, uh, which is awesome because he's the 30 for the Dread End. Um, and he's also got the extra one uh, counter that you can place around the board very flexibly, which is very awesome. It helps you reach on other one prize decks. Um, so when you are using things like your Hooper, doing that Assault a gate for 90 you can be adding in things like zigzagoon and scoop up net um onto them to knock out things like david lecephalons opposing hoopers that sort of stuff uh spiritums even a few things like that so that can be a really really nice deal for you um so these zigzagoon damage placements are not to be um underestimated i would say and like i said if you are using those early power excel attacks if you're hitting into something that will eventually evolve into a v max you can just start powering all your zigzagoons into that active spot and hoping that maybe a dread end could even get you that one shot after you've uh, given it the initial poke so zigzagoon very flexible very cool we have three copies of the hooper uh if it's um moved from the bench to the active it's just a one for 90 which is very very solid we play a lot of um hide energy and a lot of air balloons in here so it's quite easy for us to flexibly move in and out of this card and it gives us a really nice one prize option like i said there are still some one prize decks uh, floating around here. Um, so being able to trade one for one against those things and then sort of put up a big Eternatus wall uh, later on in the game can be a really nice option for you, I would say. Um, because it's still going to be a struggle for a handful of decks um, to get over an Eternatus at some point. But if you at least force that prize trade earlier on with the Hoopers, you can do some one for ones, which is pretty nice uh, overall, especially because Zigzagoon can sometimes help you up trade in other situations. For example, the new Mad Party archetype has, you know, like, Sinisties and Bunnelbees that will have really low hit points. So if you're doing a Hooper one-for-one -one trade and getting Zigzagoon value, um, you're actually coming off quite well, which is very nice. Obviously, as well, Hooper can give you a means around Zamazenta. Not a great means, because it's going to take a few shots at, uh, a few sort of bites of the cherry to get over Zamazenta. Um, but way better than trying to use Eternatus or Crobat. And uh, at the same time, it can help out against Decidueye. Also, not the greatest option because it's also weak to grass. So it has a couple issues, this Hooper. Um, but hopefully with the help of Zigzagoon and just the raw tempo of this card being an early game aggressive sort of option, it can do a decent enough job at its roll. And at the end of the day, uh, you can just bench it and it's 30 damage for Eternatus. And that's really all we're looking for here. You want to fill up the bench ASAP as soon as you've got that Infinity Zone rocking. 
We move on to the trainers, and once again, this is just the most baseline list I think you'll see out there. We're playing a very high ball search count, 3 com, 4 great ball, 4 quick ball. Aim in the game, get yourself an early crowbat, get yourself that early Eternatus, and get an energy onto it, so that you can start working towards the VMAX on the following turn. Very easy stuff. Um, the high physical Eternatus VMAX count alongside those comms, and hopefully the great balls gives you decent numbers towards getting these by turn 2. The scoop up nets are a really nice deal because it means now the three hoopers and the four zigzagoons are very, very easily uh, moved out of the active on those opening turns as well. So you can sort of just leave them there in the opening turns. They actually act as uh, optimal basics uh, to start with in the game for the most part, unless you are going second and want that energy excel option. Um, so definitely all good things to bear in mind. We also have the three air balloons. It's something you can put onto your Crobats. It's something you can put onto your active um, Eternatus V. And if you want to attach to your bench Eternatus V uh, with the sort of hope that your opponent can't find Gust or whatever, you can always just balloon out of the regular V and VMAX the new active that you've attached to on the bench. So these air balloons are very flexible. I prefer using them to switches because I'm not expecting a huge amount of status in the format. Now, that could change. Um, Raichu could still be a card that's potentially played in things like Vikavolt archetypes or a couple other things. Um, I'm expecting Picarom to be a far less relevant archetype and lightning stuff in general. Um, <clears throat> so if there is a big dip in Raichu Raichu, there's not much status going around like at all. So you can really get away with playing Balloon for the most part. Um, and I really like it because it's insta-play at, at any point in the game. Um, whereas switches uh, can sometimes clog the hand and make sure that you or it forces you to draw like one less card with Crobat at times. Whereas the Air Balloon, even if it's not useful at the right moment, you can always insta-play it down and just still bat draw up cards. So that's why I'm preferring Balloons right now. But if status is a thing, I can certainly see this becoming Switches. For Stadiums, we're playing double Viridian and one Black Market Prism Star. The Black Market as well can help out in those sort of one prize sort of trading decks. And just at any point in uh, all sorts of situations, that Black Market can be clutch. And, you know, if someone's... Uh, dealing with a 340 hit point Pokemon and only taking two prizes for it, it's going to feel pretty bad. So if the black market sticks, it's going to be excellent for you. I like having these extra Viridians in here as well. So you're contesting the Stadium War, hopefully in the earlier turns, and just making your opponent have more outs in that late game towards that black market if we can time it well enough. Um, we're only playing a couple copies of Research in this deck, so you can actually control when to play the black market quite nicely. And these Viridians obviously give you additional outs to early game attachments, which is such a big deal, as we've seen with Dragapult, um, how they sort of work towards energy spinners in the later portions of this format, or the previous format, I should say. Um, they added in more and more outs towards just hitting your basic energy card, and I think uh, that's what we've also done here. We play 10 physical energies and then two Viridians and a Piers, so we have like a really good uh, amount of cards that can get us towards energy in those opening turns. For supporters, I did just mention Piers. We're going to play just one copy of this guy right now. Um, it allows you to search your deck for one dark Pokemon and any one energy, reveal them and put them into your hand. Piers seems relatively flexible and I do like using him, but I haven't found him to be like mind-blowingly good. I think I prefer this to having a fourth copy of Communication though, so that's why I have added in the Piers. Gives you, again, that extra one-off out towards energy cards that extra flexible out to just find potentially a Crobat for draw, potentially an Eternatus VMAX, all these things are additional outs towards getting your optimal setup, which I think is slightly valuable, but not so valuable that I want to commit my engine to it, because at the end of the day, these other three supporters that are already established are so solid. Research, still some good dump and draw in there for you. A fairly high boss's orders count, obviously we can't um, use Elder Goss here, so three to four copies of boss I think is going to be... Um, more or less the right number for this Eternatus deck, so you can pick off multiple prize Pokemon. And Marnie is my most favoured supporter in here, because we already have such high counts of Ball Search and Crobats that we can fall back on post-Marnie, and we even have things like Viridian and stuff to reduce our hand size further, that we can really try and disrupt our opponent's hand size as we go, knowing that we can always top up our own hand, and especially a list like this that is so basic and just like, I just want to get Eternatus and start swinging. Uh, it really leans into this Marnie quite nicely because you just have the maximum outs for basically everything you want to do, whilst at the same time giving your opponent that headache of having only a few cards to play with. So I really like leaning into this Marnie as much as possible because disruption is still like a really big deal. And as more and more VMAX decks come into the format, 
there's just more higher chances that the opponent can't do enough with only like a five card hand as they start their turn. So Marnie seems like really good in my opinion. Onto the energies. I've mentioned that capture a couple of times. Uh, just wanted to put that point out there that because your main attacker and even your uh, basic attacking uh, regular Eternatus V both have a colorless in their cost, there's basically zero downside to playing one capture energy. Um, I don't want to play more copies of this though, because then you can, you know, come into those situations where you're missing your basic darks and whatnot. And at the end of the day, you still want to have a decent count of the dark energies for your access to hoopers and stuff in the early turns as well. So just the one copy, but it is certainly a helpful card. Providing that colorless and then getting you the extra uh, basic straight onto the board. Usually it's going to be the Hooper or another Eternatus V. Uh, because obviously you would rarely use a Zigzagoon or a Chromat V. Because you want to put them from hand to bench. Uh, whereas Capture is direct from deck. We have three copies of that Hide Energy. Giving us even more means of pivoting around our stuff. It again means that if you started Eternatus V and you're staring down you know, some aggressive deck that can potentially get over your V on turn two, like a Zacian deck or some sort of welder deck that can deal 220 or so quite quickly. Um, you can just hide your way out of there, go into one of your one prizes like Zigzagoon or Hooper, and just sort of leave them out there knowing that you have three air balloons and four scoop up nets as outs to get them out of the way. Uh, so these hard energies can help protect the V uh, quite happily before it becomes the V Max. It means that if the V Max has been smacked, you can then just retreat out of it, maybe for like a Hooper to finish things off quite happily. So again, make that prize trade a little bit more awkward for the opponent, force them to have bosses orders and all those sorts of things. So yeah, these hides have been very flexible and make the Hoopers just far stronger cards as well. They can sort of make their way into the game much more often, which is very cool. And then we have the six copies of Basic Dark, um, that obviously work off of the Viridians as well, so something nice to bear in mind. Here's the full list. Uh, it's also going to be in the description as always. Take your screenshots now, but once again, you can always check the description for that sort of thing. Onto the tech options, there's a lot of ways that I've been wackier with this build, and I've kind of reined it into a very basic list as I always like to do once we uh, get to the start of a new format, but I have been experimental with a few other bits and pieces here and there. There are still other uh, dark Pokemon that you can use to populate your bench. Obviously, you're looking for sort of dark friends that you can have alongside Eternatus because he's always looking for, you know, damage buff at the very least. Uh, Ariados is a new gusting option, but only for evolutions. Weavile GX saw a lot of play in the Japanese meta, but I do believe that that was partly down to the fact that they could play Sneaky Smash Sneasel which has um, rotated for us. And also they got to play Evil Admonition Weavile. So that sort of mini package was far more relevant for the Japanese meta than it will be in ours for the most part. But that Weavile GX could still be a decent way, especially at dealing with things like uh, Zamazentas and stuff like that, because um, it does a bit more damage and it can actually tank Zamazenta hits, which things like the Hoopers kind of just like fall at their feet a lot of the time and you have to sack a lot of prizes to get through uh zamazentas and if they're playing malolanas things are going to get rough for you i would say spiritum could be another potential one prize attacking option if you want to it's far slower than it was in the previous format where you don't have hustle belt or rainbow though and alolan persian gx saw uh very niche play in the previous format at times just to have an answer to baby blacephalon now I found the Baby Blacephalon matchup a little unfavored, but not so unfavored that I want to commit to this Persian. But if you want to have a slightly better matchup against that deck, you can certainly add this in if you want to. Um, Baby Blown basically plays like just the four Blowns these days and like maybe a Victini V and maybe a um, maybe a Cramorant. So very not, really not many good answers to this Persian for the most part. Weak Guard Energy could take the place of the Capture Energy. Um, if you're really expecting a lot of fighting decks to become a thing. And I think if fighting is going to become more relevant, you could even go up to like two weak guard energies or just increase the peers count and give yourself better access to this card. So if you're worried that, you know, this is just going to get insta countered by the fighting decks, the fact that Eternatus has one colorless in attack cost is like so, so crazy good. So uh, it's not going to be that simple for the fighting guys just to, you know, hit for weakness and laugh straight in your face. So definitely something to bear in mind. Um, I've also thought about having Crushing Hammers in here. Crushing Hammers have been very good in Mirror Match for me. Same for Dangerous Drill, especially if Hide Energy is going to be as powerful as I think it will be. Um, you can try and capitalize on that. The one thing I will note is oftentimes you'd be surprised how much you actually just need to put your Pokemon into play for damage for the most part. So uh, Dangerous Drill uh, could be a decent Mirror Tech, could be good against a few other things, as can the Crushing Hammers. 
I'm actually leaning more towards the crushing hammer style of things because it's more usable in most other situations. Uh, it can sometimes have like random uses, even against things like Center Scorch we've found, where you can keep yourself out of like Heatran GX range and a few other pieces here and there. So the crushings feel more versatile and more insta play, which is always something you have in mind because you're playing Crobat V. I've seen Turbo Patch go into some lists if you're paranoid about other people having some energy removal. I've also seen an Ordinary Rod sometimes thrown in here and there if you're scared of um, your Infinity Zone just getting shut off upon a knockout. Or if you're worried about Belelba Bryson Man, uh, you can try and have Ornery Rod to recover some of your Pokemon to maintain your damage output. All de decent things to bear in mind. And if you don't think Eternatus' damage is quite good enough as is, you could think about having Candy Obzigoon in your deck for some untamed shouts on top of all your Zigoon pings, which could be interesting. Or you could think about having Giant Bomb as a tool of choice, because at the moment we only have Air Balloons, and those rarely find their way onto the VMAXs. You could have giant bombs that you just sort of jam in there and force your opponent to get over or gust around and just like we saw with Dragapult oftentimes it played giant bomb just to force the opponent to gust which meant that you had more freedom to just keep those attachments flowing throughout the game so that's also something to bear in mind you can punish the opponent and have even more damage output at your disposal if you want to. For the matchup overview this should give you guys a nice taster of what we're thinking the post-rotation meta is going to look like. Now, you'll see Peak Rom and Dragapult in the top left corner. That's just uh, based on how they did in the previous format. We're not thinking those are the tippy-top contenders anymore. But uh, on the left side of the screen is going to be existing archetypes and ones that we think maybe come back into the fold. Things like Frostmoth and Phalanx and Sandaconda Colossal. They haven't been you know, relevant at all really until this set, but we're... Seeing those archetypes maybe start to come into the fold. And then on the right hand list, these are all potential new decks that we're going to be profiling over the next weeks um, before PTCGO comes out for the most part, hopefully. Uh, so yeah, keep these in mind. I'm going to try and do a daily deck list between me and Jack. So definitely something to be aware of. But for now, I think the only real awkward matchups that we've found uh, to date are going to be Luke Metalization, which often has hammers uh, often has that luke metal gx attack that offers even more energy removal and just the fact that zamazenta is very very tanky uh, can oftentimes have malolanas at its disposal multiple and even has the new um toughness cape so it's gonna have a huge amount of hit points it probably just gets through the army of hoopers for the most part and we don't really have any good answer right now if you want to improve your time against zamazenta you can definitely think about having those weavile options uh maybe even red and blue as well to give yourself some acceleration or even those turbo patterns that we did mention um excadrill also a little bit awkward obviously if you go too far ahead early on with like hooper pressure or whatever they can punish you with uh the martial arts dojo down the line which is quite scary uh to get over an eternatus in one attachment also they can simply you know gust the crobats because they're also weak to fighting so Excadrill naturally is a pretty awkward matchup. Now, bear in mind, Excadrill does lose um, Zeb Striker, so it has to work on its own engine. So it may be a lot weaker than we've seen it previously in terms of how it draws. Maybe it's still just going to be relevant because of its typing, though. Speaking of typing, Phalanx and Sandaconda Colossal may have a bit of breath of life just based on the fact that they are fighting types and can maybe swing into Eternatus. That's really why I wanted to drive home the idea of uh, weakness guard energy because it could certainly be just a way to like laugh in the face of these sorts of decks coming into the format, uh, because it's rare that Sandaconda or Phalanx will have the space to play uh, energy removal alongside that. So yeah, oftentimes I think you can get away with that, which is going to be pretty cool. Uh, and I think Decidueye is the most um, threatening new archetype from the set. Um, it's just an annoying wall. Like I said, it has weakness on Hooper if they're playing things like Big Charm and stuff. And they obviously have scoop up nets naturally in their list because they're playing Jirachi engine for the most part. Um, they're going to be undoing a decent chunk of damage most of the time. And it's just going to be really rough for your army of hoopers to get through, even with Zigzagoon scoop up net. It could maybe become a bit better if you are adding in that sort of candy Obstagoon option. Um, or even those giant bombs because they hit 180 through the hooper with weakness as well. So a few things to bear in mind that could potentially improve that matchup, which is quite fun. Um, so... We'll see how that goes, but at the moment I believe Decidueye might be able to out-resource Eternatus for the most part. Um, if there's any other decks that we've missed, I try to be quite, uh, quite uh, liberal and comprehensive with this matchup overview, giving you a good taster of what's sort of in store over the next couple of weeks. 
Um, but if you want any other decks on here, just comment down below and I'll try and get them added to this matchup overview uh, in future and also so that we can uh, try and build the list ourselves. For my closing thoughts, at the end of the day, Eternatus is going to be great. It's a pace setter, it's consistent, it's a powerhouse. So it will basically be one of these decks where the format almost is warped around it. So that's definitely something that I've felt early on with Eternatus. If you're not, if you're building decks, not really thinking about that Eternatus matchup, you're going to have a bad time almost always. So it will certainly create the meta around it for the most part. I do think Zamazenta and Decidueye will prove to be awkward, and certainly um, I haven't found the best ways of dealing with these walls just yet. So um, comments, again, down below, always appreciated for those easy answers to get yourself through those, um, because at the moment I think those are easy ways that can certainly slow you down, especially if the opponent is managing their bench quite well. Obviously the Decidueye deck, again, can play those scoop-up nets, they can maybe... Uh, limit themselves to just a couple desis and Zamazenta, as long as they're not, you know, benching six prizes worth of stuff uh, other than the Zamazenta, they can make life very aw awkward for you. Um, so I do think those are things to bear in mind. I also think Energy Denial could just be a tech card. We saw Crushing Hammer going into Dragapult decks. We saw Last, or what's it called, uh, Wait and See Hammer going into Picaroms at times. We saw all sorts of energy disruption in the previous format because Dragapult was a one attach a turn deck for the most part. Eventually Dragapult oftentimes put in a 1-1 Malamar line to combat this. And I feel like it could be a small back and forth like that in this meta where people are adding in Crushing Hammers Potentially Eternatus is moving towards their own turbo patches to sort of coin flip back against the opponent. Um, potentially there'll be some uh, Weavile red-blue combo going on as well for some extra burst acceleration. Even Rose. I think Rose is probably worse than all the other options that I've mentioned so far. Uh, but that could be another way to just burst energy into play for Eternatus. So things to bear in mind for sure. Finally, another thing I'd say is that one of the only other sort of get out of jail free options that people have is just ignoring Eternatus VMAX because it's too damn chunky. It's never really going down unless you're hitting it for weakness in one hit. And if you're going to be able to trade against them, you're just trying to use things like coin flip catches or a high count of boss's orders and just saying, give me that crowbat instead for the most part and keeping up the trade that way. Uh, I definitely think ADPization will retain its title as one of the top decks in the format for exactly that reason. Uh, I've started out trying some turbo patch e-switch combo lists uh, that also has a very high boss's orders count and i've also tried um a list that has the four coin flip catchers as well as a lot of uh, draw support um, and still playing a couple boss as well and turbo patches so trying to just jam as many coin flips in as possible uh with the ultimate goal being we can ignore returnitus and just out prize race them by stealing those crowbat fees instead so those are my initial thoughts on Eternatus. I do feel like in testing it has been one of the strongest out the gate, uh, but certainly not unbeatable. There's tons of things that Eternatus is going to have to um, figure out if it does want to remain top tier throughout the entirety of Darkness Ablaze. Let me know what you think about the deck list and how you've been playing Eternatus so far. Is there a certain tech card I've been missing? Are there easy ways around these walls that I've mentioned? How have you found it so far? I'll hear it all down below. Thanks so much for watching, guys. And we'll be back tomorrow with another Darkness Ablaze deck. Cheers.